Hello and welcome to the Oxford Forum for Questioning Extremism's penultimate event of Hillary Tub. I'm Freddie Felton, president here at the OFQE, and it's my pleasure today to be interviewing Dr. Gail Bradbrook, co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, on whether Extinction Rebellion is an extremist organization. In this event, we will begin with a speech from Gail on the foundations of XR, its vision, aims, and methodologies, alongside her thoughts on the question under investigation today regarding the charge of extremism. Following this, Gail and I will be in conversation for around 20 to 25 minutes, in which we'll discuss the relationship between the adjective extremist and the activism of XR, as well as giving her the opportunity to address critiques leveled at XR from the outside, as well as inside the broader climate movement. We'll finish this event with a Q&A segment in which you, the audience, will be able to pose your question directly to our guest by pressing the raise hand feature, and I can subsequently unmute you. So it's now my pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Gail Bradbrook to talk us briefly for Extinction Rebellion and how she understands the challenge of being labelled an extremist organisation. Gail, take it away. Freddie, thanks so much and thanks for everybody who's joining us. I um, really appreciate this opportunity to talk about this issue. Obviously, I don't think we're extremists. Um, I want to dedicate what I have to say today to some brave rebels who actually glued themselves in a courtroom today and have been sentenced for to 14 days in prison, one of whom is Tracy Maligan um, of our um, XR working class group, uh, 44 mum of three. She said, I'm here today as an angry mum fighting for my kids. All children should have a chance at a future on a habitable planet. Our establishments are facilitating social murder and ecocide. The courts are failing us. I don't do this out of contempt, but out of love. And the other woman was Sally Davidson, 33. She said, I'm choosing to disobey in the doc today to ask the court to not only say they agree with the science about the climate crisis, but to act like it's real by allowing the defense argument of necessity to be heard in activist trials. Um, I hold the UK courts to be complicit in our government's failure to act urgently and proportionately on the climate and ecological emergency. So thank you so much to those courageous rebels, Tracy and Sally. So I wanted to start by outlining where we are regarding climate and ecological crisis in important context. There was a science uh, paper from Nature this January that says we are heading, whatever we do, for two degrees of warming. So that means that the Paris Agreement, where we were to stay near to one and a half degrees, has failed. Uh, people are going to suffer and die as a result of that disparity between one and a half and two degrees, and especially in the global south. So you're looking at parts of Southeast Asia becoming uninhabitable, a massive decline in food crops, especially in Africa, 1.7 billion people experiencing severe heat waves, up to several hundred million more people becoming exposed to climate related risks and poverty. And then um, another paper, a Frontiers paper from January this year, uh, 17 ecological scientists from across the globe said that the scale of the threats to the biosphere and all its life forms, including humanity, is in fact so great that it's difficult to grasp, even for well-informed experts. So like, what are we talking about? Well, last June, the government's own climate change committee said that we should start to prepare for a four degree warm, warmer world even though in 2008 they said that if that was reached, extreme consequences potentially beyond our ability to adapt would arise. And according to Professor Kevin Anderson, it's widespread view, there's a widespread view that four degrees C is incompatible with an organized global community. What we're talking about, incredible commentators like David Attenborough say, is we're talking about the collapse of our civilization. Uh, Johan Rockstrand, the professor at the Potsdam Institute, estimates that four degrees of warming, half the planet dies, billions of people. We're talking about crimes against humanity that are being committed right now uh, by the policies of the government. Now, since the Paris Agreement, banks have spent 2.7 trillion on new fossil fuel explorations, 15% coming from the UK. The UK government canceled lots of green programs um, and added a duty to optimize fossil fuel extraction into an infrastructure bill. It was a way of pushing fracking and other things. It's pressing ahead with HS2. It's the biggest um, deforestation in the UK since World War I, even though we know we're one of the most nature depleted uh, parts of, the, of Europe. You've got incinerators opening across the UK. There were some coal fired power stations and new coal mining in Cumbria and Durham. 
a new road building programme announced 27 billion, and we're the worst subsidisers of fossil fuels in Europe. This is a country that claims it's doing leadership on, on, the, on the crisis. So you had a, a, a report came out today from the Public Accounts Committee saying that the government is failing to create a credible plan, even though it's you know almost two years since it announced its net zero target. Uh, and according to the Tyndall Centre, where our emissions are more than twice what they should be, according to you know our parents compliant carbon budget. So it's a mess, folks, right? And XR was launched in October 2018 with three simple demands. Tell the truth, we're in an absolute mess, a climate and ecological emergency, halt biodiversity and loss. And we want a, a really quick net zero target. We've said not 2025. And we want the how of how we do that to be decided by a citizens assembly that's legally binding. So it's important to say that we are a rebellion and not a protest group, right? So you've got enlightenment thinkers like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, who talked about the social contract between government and citizens, who said there's a right or a duty of a people to rebel against a government that acts against their common interests or threatens the safety of its people. And our theory of change is that mass participation in civil disobedience forces a government to act. And we believe we have the right to do that. So thousands of rebels have been arrested in peaceful civil disobedience, actions like sitting in a road, criminal damage um, from spray chalk in buildings to breaking windows, trespass, you know, sitting in trees that are going to be cut down. Uh, we've recently launched a deck strike, we're planning a tax strike. All, all of these things build on a noble tradition of civil disobedience. The Chartists and suffragettes broke windows. That's why people here today have the vote. You had a mass trespass on Kinder Scout. That's why you have the right to roam. Gandhi did assault tax rebellion. That's why Indian independence happened. Uh, the civil rights movement under Martin Luther King's leadership and others uh, had a strategy of arrest. Um, the XR tactics are especially inspired by the gay rights movement ACT UP who have felt compelled to break the law to save the lives of gay people who were being murdered by homophobes and socially murdered by, by the government's responses, really poor responses to the AIDS crisis. So um, Lord Jonathan Sumption last year at the Royal Society of Medicine said it can be morally acceptable to break the law. And that's actually, there's an actually a defense that means you haven't broken the law if there's a reason to do it. It's called the necessity defense or, or it's about duress of circumstances. You had Lord Hoffman in 2006 saying, civil disobedience on conscientious grounds has a long honourable history in this country. People who break the law to affirm their belief in the injustice of the law or government action are sometimes vindicated by history. The suffragettes are an example. Um, so we've been effective, right? <laughs> Extinction Rebel, what we've done, we've, we haven't won, but we have been effective. Uh, this movement spread to 75 countries. There's over a thousand groups across the world. People have been arrested or risked arrest. Uh, people in their 90s, people use wheelchairs, grandparents, rabbis, priests, lawyers, scientists, doctors, ordinary people, mothers, grandparents, you know. But for every arrestee, you have to have, to have like 10 people behind the scenes who support them. You're not required to get arrested to be part of XR. We need people who, who, uh, who don't want to be. And um, it's, it's certainly a movement that wants to include everyone in that way. Um, and what's happened as a result of XR is that government and institutions across the world have declared a climate emergency. And the, the, the whole space has changed, right? So we were named as the number one influencer on the crisis at COP25 by Analytica. And you can see a correlation on the graph from YouGov about you know, public opinion on the crisis and our actions. Um, I've personally been arrested four times, including for breaking a pane of glass at the Department for Transport. Uh, I've been told I face six months or a year in jail for that. I don't mean to be immodest, but I, I, I'm saying this in terms of effectiveness, right? I was then named one of the 50 most influential people in Britain and, and put on the Women's Hour power list uh, last year for women based in the UK making a significant positive contribution. So, you know, are we heroes or are we extremists? <laughs> That's a question. And actually I'd say we're just ordinary people who feel we have to act because our leaders are failing to do so. There's a risk though, that when you uh, do these kinds of actions, it's not explained to people that some people will see what you're doing is extreme. Malcolm X spoke at Oxford University in 1964 and he said, 
I don't believe in any form of unjustified extremism, but when a man is exercising extremism, a human being is exercising extremism in defense of liberty for human beings, it's no vice. And when one is moderate in the pursuit of justice for human beings, I say he's a sinner. So it's been suggested that we're extremists, that we should be reclassified as organized criminals, as well as being ridiculous, this would mean that parts of the police force who are focused on violent terrorism, bribery, corruption and organised theft would have to, you know, put their resources to investigating, frankly, a bunch of hippies who want to sit in the streets, you know. Um, and that's led Paul Stevens, who's one of our spokespeople, a retired detective sergeant from the Met Police, saying, tasking the police with investigating several thousand peaceful protesters who dare to speak truth to power will be laughed at by real police officers and distract them from the necessary task of keeping us all safe. It also wastes time for people in institutions when they have to refer people like us to, to the PREVENT program. It's a real nonsense. So, you know, in a way, it would seem a joke to me that we're being accused of extremism if it wasn't so dangerous. And I want to make this really important point and put this on the public record. I think that bogus and ridiculous accusations of extremism put extremists, put, sorry, put Extinction Rebellion rebels' lives at risk. You know, when Joe Cox, the British MP for Batley and Spen, was murdered in 2016 by a neo-Nazi, Thomas Mayer, he, he said in court, my name is death to traitors, freedom for Britain. And then you had commentators like uh, David, David Aranovich in The Times saying that the political language of the time had emboldened his extremism leading to this murder. So when people are whipped up to fear and hate others, as can happen through calling people extremists, our lives are put at risk. And this is way more uh, serious for our rebels that aren't in the UK that are in places with less freedom and greater danger. Four environmentalists are killed every week uh, across the world. Our XR International Solidarity Network have advised us that rebels in their networks across the world are under much higher risks if they're associated with an organisation deemed to be extreme for political reasons. So the British government needs to stop paving the way for our nature defenders across the world, our courageous rebels to be murdered. It's clearly a politically motivated move. It's not about the safety of the British people, and if it was, they'd take actual action on this urgent climate and ecological crisis. So you've got to ask what's behind these accusations. It's clear to me the real purpose is to silence us, especially in this year when you know the UK government's leading the COP process. Uh, if we're labelled as such, we won't be able to speak in the mainstream media. And the government does not want to be held accountable. That's clear on a number of fronts. And it's part of an authoritarian culture war that's being waged. An editorial this February in the British Medical Journal considers that this government should be held accountable for the social murder of its own uh, citizens because of their uh, politicians willful negligent, um, willfully neglecting scientific advice and so on in their approach to COVID-19, including this really appalling blanket imposition of do not resuscitate orders in care homes you know they've been involved in killing British people and if you look at the right-wing tabloids do you see any sense of holding this government to account um, what we've got is the media concentrated in the hands of a few billionaire owners and uh, you know peddling their own agenda in September 2020 the UK government was formally warned by the Council of Europe for threatening press freedom after it blacklisted a group of investigative journalists and denied them access to freedom, access to information. It had been, it had been um, issued with a, a freedom alert in, in May when journalists were banned from asking questions at a coronavirus press conference. We remain one of the worst countries in Western Europe for freedom of the press, um, according to report, Reporters Without Borders, ranked 33 behind Jamaica, you know, Ghana, Namibia, South Africa, and so on. And so this, you know, this tie up of like this accusation of extremism and the press needs to be noted. Uh, there was an article in Byline pointing out that uh, this new right wing news channel that wants to start GB News, one of the original founders, Sir Robbie Gibb, had been in a business partnership with 
John Zach Woodcock and um, who's, who's Lord Walney and William Shawcross. So the people that are supposed to investigate us trying to push this right wing agenda. Um, it, it was Woodcock that was supposed to conduct a review into political extremism and um, a report on it. And, and then you, you also had uh, Shawcross um, as a reviewer in the prevent, on the prevent strategy a process which former regional chief crown prosecutor Nazir Afsal described as rigged. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly done, by the way. Um, so there are serious concerns about the government trying to undermine free speech, including in a really Orwellian move to apparently protect free speech, um, including of groups that promote the hatred of, of gay folks. Um, this uh, move has been named by Yale professor Jason Stanley as a classic moves on behalf of fascism in his and, and, and he's been quoting from his book how fascism works the politics of us and them uh, this week a global coalition for transparency and anti-corruption has put the uk government under review um keith chair keith sorry kevin keith the chair of the uk open government network said the uk's government reputation for openness and accountability is in free fall um, You've got this looking at judicial reviews, you know, review and judicial reviews. Judicial reviews are a really important part of holding the government to account. That's under review. Controversial re review of human rights law, the spy cops bill, which was trying to give immunity to undercover police who might sleep with um, and have children with activists has happened in the past, a form of rape. Um, and there are close ties between the current cabinet and the policy exchange think tank who wrote a report on us um, who said that we were extremists. Um, we don't know who funded that because they're one of the most opaque think tanks in terms of funding, but we do know they've had funding in the past from Drax, uh, the Trade Association, Energy UK, gas companies, and, and so on. Uh, so why are we seen as extremists, just to, just to finish? It's simply because we suggest that the economic system and our democratic processes have been and are insufficient to tackle the crisis. We question economic growth and we want more deliberative democracy like citizens assemblies so if we're extremists we're joined in these views by other well-known extremists such as the imf the world economic forum the economist magazine economists at the deutsche bank the treasury funded das Gupta review and prince charles i mean come on you know when life on earth is being killed questions about democracy and political economy are legitimate and necessary and as these crises hit, the risk of fascism rises. Trying to position XR as extremists, trying to silence us, is another move in the direction of fascism. Thank you, Gail, for that um, resounding speech. Um, really useful, so much to touch upon there. And I, I think we're gonna try over the next 20 minutes to get into it as deeply as possible. Um, so the first thing I wanna touch upon is how, um, you know, humanity students will know this especially, especially the social scientists, that definitions of terms are incredibly difficult to come by. Um, extremism is certainly contentious. There's no obvious definition. The UK's government's counter extremism strategy defined extremism in 2015 as the vocal or active opposition to our shared values. These include democracy and the rule of law, mutual respect and tolerance of other faiths and beliefs. We also consider calling for the death of our armed forces, either in the UK or overseas to be extremism. The police, on the other hand, have defined domestic extremism as relating to the activity of groups or individuals who commit or plan serious criminal activity motivated by a political or ideological viewpoint. Now, the reason why I've uh, provided these definitions is to show the interchangeability of definitions of extremism, as well as to highlight in particular the importance of the rule of law. So under the police definition and arguably the government CES definition, it seems that XR in its clear strategy to transgress laws via civil disobedience counts as a domestic extremist organization. But my question to you is, do you think that XR and adoption of civil resistance tactics can ever escape this charge, given the emphasis on, precisely on the rule of law? Well, you know, in the rule of law, you have the defense of necessity. You have uh, the defense of duress of circumstances, which says under certain circumstances, breaking them all makes sense. So if your house is on fire, Freddie, and I break a window to get in, 
and rescue you, then I haven't committed criminal damage because there was a good reason to do it. If I sped up the motorway to get my uh, friend to hospital to have a baby or whatever, I, you know, duress of circumstances. So actually what Extinction Rebellion argues is that we're not really even breaking the law. We know we're risking arrest. We know we're at risk of being charged and we know we're at risk of being jailed in some cases, but we don't think we're breaking the law because we think that we're doing something that's uh, necessary uh, based on the history of civil disobedience. And given that what we've done has been seen to change the dial on the most significant uh, existential threat uh, that humanity's ever faced, then I think we have got a very, very strong case. Now, whether um, that you know, lands in the courts is another matter, but bear in mind it has uh, worked in the past for people who, I think they scaled Drax uh, one time, uh, environmentalists and also you had uh, peace activists that took hammers to a hawk jet that was going to go to Indonesia and bomb people and in both cases it was understood that that was an act of necessity and uh, my own uh, colleague Roger Hallam who had uh, done some spray chalking with others in, um, uh, in, in a university in the university where he was studying um, he, he was led off by, by a jury who, who understood that what he'd done was, was a necessary thing to do um, and had actually achieved uh, the effect, the desired effect to get um, that university to um, uh, divest. Right. Um, you, you, might, you might recall that um, last year, counterterrorism police sent out a document in which they placed XR on a list of extremist ideologies that should be reported to authorities regarding the PREVENT programme. Um, XR was listed alongside far right white nationalist group nationalist national action as well as terrorism supporting Salafist group and Mujahideen. Um, this document was later recalled and XR was subsequently removed from the list with counterterrorism chiefs saying that it was a mistake that they don't see you as an extremist group. Do you think that the move to place you on that list was a sincere error of judgment where they perhaps misunderstood your aims and methods or do you think they knew full well what XR stood for and would have kept you on that list if it weren't for external pressure? I mean, obviously, I don't know the sort of uh, internal workings of these institutions. I was trying to find the um, the comment. I think I think the group that um, that works on organised crime was saying, please don't classify these people as organised criminals. We've got to get on with actually finding out, you know, and dealing with organised criminals, not 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 dealing with these folks. I mean, you you also had guidelines sent to schools that said that don't use any materials that's extremist. Um, even if that bit of material isn't extreme, for example, uh, if the if if the anti-capitalist, you know, like how can questioning an economic system uh, that's destroying life on earth, that's questioned in the Treasury's Dask Up to review, that's questioned um, by the World Economic Forum, be a, an extremist move? I, I think what's what's being driven here is that people want to silence. Um, want to silence organizations like us. Well, well let, let's let's focus in on that a bit. Um, policy exchange you, you brought up um, just a minute ago in their July 2019 report, Extremism Rebellion. Um, what their integral focus was, was what they see as um, anti-democratic politics. Um, and the basis for this is in your relationship with parent companies, Compassionate Rebellion and Rising Up. The, the latter, I believe, has a very strong relationship in terms of your funding. Um, you can correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, Compassionate Revolution states on their website that we do not believe that we have functioning democracy in the UK. You've made allusions to this in your opening statement. Uh, are you states in its manifesto that it wishes to move to a liquid democracy? And um, what these commentators say is that this kind of appears a sponsorship of an anarchic state. Policy Exchange latched onto this. They said that XR is a campaign which at its core supports an overturning of the existing economic, social and political order. Um, now, perhaps this seems warranted given the new focus of money rebellion um, as an offshoot of XR in demanding significant upheaval, if not wholesale rejection of neoliberal capitalism. So my question here is, do you agree with this anti-democratic presentation of XR? Is it possible to believe in our current system of governance and espouse XR's ideology? I mean, I, I don't believe we have a functioning democracy. Obviously, it's something, you know, you get to vote and so on. But people know that who decides the election in the UK is Rupert Murdoch. Right. I mean, the sun, it was the sun what won it. Uh, I made a daft video once called 15 Ways to Fake a Democracy. It, it, it covers issues like uh, the gagging law, where you're not allowed to talk about issues in the run up to an election as, a, as an NGO. 
uh, or you can get fined. Uh, what we uh, care about um, in XR is citizens' assemblies, as people know. So what we want is more democracy, not less democracy. Um, citizens' assemblies are legitimate ways of um, asking ordinary people what they think. So we don't say, oh, you know, we want this policy or that policy. We just simply say, hand it over to the people. Could you give an example of how a citizens' assembly is being used maybe elsewhere in the world? Um, just to... I mean, a citizens' assembly was used in Ireland to think about um, changing the abortion rules. Um, so it's it's used in, in times when there's... Um, a sort of controversial issue but it you know there was also a, a, a citizens assembly in france that that united the gilets jaunes and uh, the climate movement together to say actually we need to do something you know there needs to be a change in democracy so people have a say obviously what actually happens is that unless these things are legally binding which they need which they need to be um, they get um, diluted so we did have a climate assembly in the uk but because it's not legally binding, it just doesn't get the focus. It just seems like a sort of quite extensive consultation process. And it came out and said, for example, that we should have a frequent flyer tax, but I don't see any move for that to be uh, implemented. Instead, what you've got is an expansion of aviation in the UK at a time when we just really don't need that. Um, the, you know, the, the form of democracy that uh, XR is uh, being promoting is um, the form of democracy that was the original forms of democracy in Athens. Um, and you've got people like Matthew Taylor of the RSA, Gordon Brown, uh, The Economist magazine saying, we need more forms of digital democracy, of, of deliberative democracy. So we're not here to say again, what it should look like, but yeah, I'd personally love to, that, that to be a review of uh, democracy in the UK, again, led by citizens with expert panels and so on, and thinking about where we've got blockages and improving, improving what happens. And another criticism that was proposed by this um, contentious PE document, uh, policy exchange document, which was also brought up in the recent BBC Hard Talk interview with uh, fellow co-founder Roger Hallam, um, was the potential for violent activism at some stage. Now, this particular objection was um, couched in the notion of drones being flown around Heathrow, which um, I believe was the, uh, was that you decided against. Um, Roger said that violent extremism may simply just be a consequence of the government's inaction. Do you agree that XR is laying the intellectual foundations for subsequent violent activism and that it's inevitable? Um, and I, I would never attempt to speak on behalf of Roger. Sure. Uh, what, what has been said in the past is that, um, I, I can't remember the quote, um, but it's essentially that um, if you don't achieve things through non-violent civil disobedience, then what comes later is a, is a meltdown and you get violence. It's not us saying that's what we want to see happen. It's just us saying that is the natural consequence of um, a civilization collapsing. When we talk about the collapse of civil, civilization, we're talking about mass war and rape and fights over resources. And, you know, you've had a glimpse of it with the COVID crisis with people fighting over you know, toilet rolls in the supermarket when society starts to melt down. So we're just talking about what comes if we don't do it this way. We're not talking about anything that, that we believe uh, should or we want to have happen. Um, you know, Roger's a, a peace activist. He's been jailed for his peace activism many years ago. And um, I think the other thing that was in that report that people quoted was, that possibility that people would die, you know, and I, I went on public record saying I was willing to die. And I didn't mean like in a violent, you know, that I'm going to be doing anything violent. I meant just what I was talking about earlier, that when you put yourself forwards as a and become a public figure and um, you, you, you lead civil disobedience movements, we know what's happened to people in the past. People have been uh, killed who've taken on that. And as I said, it's four environmental activists a week that get killed so um i we, we've had people under a tunnel um around euston station who could have died the way that was being handled people are risking their lives for this cause in peaceful ways it's the it's the state and the force of the state where the violence lies not with us one of the things you touched upon there was this the notion of the apocalyptic warning the idea that if we carry on as normal we're headed to social collapse to the collapse of civilization as we know it 
it seems to be an essential part of your messaging and one of the key premises perhaps in inspiring and justifying civil disobedience especially given the potential consequence you just said about activists not only getting prosecuted but even dying in their activism um that said there is still a significant part of the population who rest unconvinced by this notion for some say they say that you know human ingenuity technological advancement will bring us back from disaster but this claim is routinely dismissed by XR. Um, do you think that this premise of an apocalyptic future needs to be enforced on wider society as an article of belief, as a fundamental axiom? Or do you think it's okay to leave people free to decide for themselves whether such an appraisal is of the future is justified? I, I just, I, I really don't think you can force beliefs on people, even if that was an okay thing to do. I mean, it's very mainstream now what we've been saying uh, with Sir David Attenborough's uh, films, you know, his his uh, vi vision of how the future is going to play out if we leave things running the way they are and how it is right now. There's there's there's, there's nothing um, there's nothing unreal about what we're saying. Um, and I think what actually really matters is that you hold people through that process of coming to terms with the path that we're on, and then you lift up a vision that change is possible. You know, that's where you want really strong vibrant leadership. I mean, it's not my favorite person on other fronts, but you know, Churchill, who led this country when it seemed impossible to, to fight off Nazism, said, yeah, you know, you, you, you had to pull off the impossible. And I think that we need to hold a vision that we could make the change. I think where radicalization comes from is when you have that absolute extreme of what's happening to the planet, and then, you know, young people um, looking at that and seeing their government doing the opposite to what needs to happen. That's what's going to, you know, it's government policy that's radicalizing, not, not, not social movements. Mm. Um, one general concern that's been raised was, and some that you just touched upon here, was the kind of the way in which perhaps XR's messaging is negative in its apocalypse. Um, and you've just said about detailing, you know, a, a vision of hope. Um, Perhaps there's, do you think the more needs to be do, done to, to, to uh, elucidate or articulate this particular image? Or do you think XR has already within itself got a very strong articulation of hope for the future? I mean, I, I, I don't particularly use the word hope myself. I think Derek Jensen, who's a deep green activist, talked about hopium. It can be a sort of thing that makes people feel like, oh, it's okay, it's all going to be okay. What makes me feel hopeful is being active, you know. Uh, Try, trying to make sure that changes happen. There's this concept of emergency mode messaging um, that's used on in many ways, actually, for example, to get people to, to stop, stop smoking, you have to say, this really bad thing's gonna happen, you can make a change and it will really help, you know, like a, a vision that change is possible. Um, I, I don't think XR has been strong enough in visioning uh, the change because, um, partly because we don't wanna say exactly what the change should be because we want it to be, um, decided by citizens' assemblies, and I think then it gets a little bit lost. I think the kind of uh, work that Rob Hopkins of the transition movement's be, been doing is really helpful. You know, the idea of moving from what is to what if. So you go like, God, oh, what if we cancelled HS2 and instead we used all that money to support farmers to transition from factory farming where the next pandemic's going to start? And, you know, um, captured all the uh, so much carbon in the soil. I think, you know, for me, that's where there's so much hope lies um, is, is because um, nature is the best carbon capture and storage vehicle that there is. So the, the things that create the crises, these multiple crises can be solved. Many of them can be solved by the same thing. So in particular, you have to deal with inequality, you know, vast inequality in the world. Uh, and you have to deal with our war on nature. You know, that, 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 that's the sort of visionary change. I mean, I maybe say a little bit more about the inequality point. You know, the COVID crisis has made that absolutely clear. Um, if we just focus on our own country and harvest all the vaccines and, uh, you know, leave other countries to just uh, fester and not have access to vaccines, um, then mutations will arise in, in, more, in more poor countries and will get reinfected. Um, you have vast inequality because of the rigged tax rules across the world. Um, 
And vast inequality also exacerbates uh, the climate crisis because rich people, frankly, do most of the emissions, like 10,000 times the emissions of other people. So um, you can't have that level of inequality anymore. It's, it's just baked into the science. Um, and then with nature, you know, uh, we've got, we don't just have a climate crisis. We've got soil that's going to run out of fertility. We've got air and water pollution. We've got... Um, an extinction event happening, you know, biodiversity and loss. And solving all of those things involves lots of carbon capture. So um, I have personally this vision of the world just becoming more beautiful and more green as a result of, um, of making change. And I also have a personal vision that as we hold people through this crisis, we have to have more democracy and we have to process go through that process of grieving and remorse together and hold each other through that and I think that's a, a process of reweaving the human family and there being more lo more love between us so I, I really have a vision of you know it, this goes in the direction of fascism or it goes in the direction of more democracy and more love and more beauty. So if we now consider disruption tactics and um, the 10-day protests in April in London it's estimated to have cost the Metropolitan Police £16 million of resources, 10,000 officers deployed over those two weeks. Um, these resources could have been used in fighting crime in particularly dangerous areas of London or even invested into community programmes that promote safety or de-escalating youth violence. Some people within these communities see such activities deeply alienating and irresponsible. So how do you engage with those individuals who have, who have grievances about how XR's activism has directly impacted their lives? I mean, our, our activism affects different people in different ways. If you happen to be the person stuck, stuck in the bus that day, then, you know, it's not, it's not cool. You know, I'm a mom and you need to get your kids places. You want to visit family when we're all around, allowed to move around. I have to say, like, Extinction Rebellion activists on the whole, I don't speak for everybody, but what I believe is we want to be planting trees. We want to be doing the transition. We want to be promoting green jobs and getting out there and making the new society that we need. We're not sitting a road, it's, it's stupid. Right? It's not good use of our time. But unfortunately, we've tried everything else, writing to the MPs and signing petitions and going on marches. It doesn't work. And we know that from, uh, you know, we know that from the history books. So we're just simply following the history books. And if, if people are gonna worry about the cost of, of, of policing, it's, it's one of the duties of the police is to uphold the right to protest. It is part of their duty. Just, you know, there's a lot of cost of policing of sporting events, for example. It's just, it, it's part of what is a function in society. Protest is what keeps us safe. And if you're worried about misspending, look at the 170 billion that's believed HS2 is gonna cost or 27 billion on new roads, or the fact that there's, you know, 10, 10 billion dollars uh, a minute of fossil fuel subsidies in the world. That's that's where the ridiculous uh, waste of money that's killing us is going. If we continue on with this particular theme, um, some critics have uh, have addressed what they call an inclusivity problem within the civil disobedience program as sponsored by XR, saying that it leads to a double standard for people from ethnic minorities. Um, it's been widely documented, for instance, that police brutality is a phenomenon predominantly experienced by people of colour, especially the black community. Black people are three times more likely to be tasered on a routine arrest, for instance. Um, you know, even putting aside differences from a racial perspective, we might talk about issues in class perspectives for ac activism as well. Many people from low income backgrounds simply can't afford to suspend work in the name of activism, let alone be arrested and what that does for their job protests. I think this is essentially probably best or arguably worse from your angle at what happened in Canning Town in 2019, where the disruption there in a his historically poor area of London stopped individuals from getting getting to work, some of whom lacked um, strong job security, for instance. Mm -hmm. So does XR have an inclusivity problem? What are you doing to address this? Yeah, so um, I mean, I think, as I said earlier, you can be part of XR without getting arrested. It's not a requirement. And absolutely, um, we've got institutional racism in the justice system. So, you know, think about it five times before you get arrested as a person of colour. Uh, it does intersect with the class uh, agenda, as you said. Um, but I, I also think there's a sort of idea that, um, oh, and by the way, you know, there's, there's been on more than one occasion, black people weren't even part of our uh, movement who just were innocent than by, you know, passers-by who've been arrested. I mean, we've witnessed firsthand the 
the racism of the police. Um, but I think it's also, you know, important to say that there's a choice there and even, um, you know, black people in, in this country have a degree of pr privilege compared to the uh, people in the global south, which are getting hit most by this crisis, right? So one of the first things that we did in Extinction Rebellion was to start setting up our XR Internationalist Solidarity Network, which is Global South led. It's in partnership with the Stop the Angamizi campaign, Recharge Genocide and Ecocide. And uh, the leader of our XR Internationalist, one of them is Kofi Mawuli Klu, who's spoken about this actually. And he points out that, you know, such strategies of getting arrested are part of radical black traditions of African heritage community resistance, not only Martin Luther King, but and Nelson Mandela and Winnie Mandela, but uh, Mangaliso, Sabuki, Steve Biko, Mark Scarvey, there's a, you know, a list here, Malcolm X, Black Panthers, Zata Shakur, Andrew Javis, you know, I think, um, what we've done is stand on the shoulders of movements of uh, racially marginalized people, like the civil rights movement, um, like the Indian independence. So, I, you know, I think to sort of speak as if having a tactic that's based on mass civil disobedience is somehow excluding, it, it feels somewhat erasing of this history of uh, civil resistance, actually, especially in the global South. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's touch upon more about the global South. Do you think that you're messaging from the beginning did did enough to um to to account for their experience of of the climate crisis at the moment you said yourself you know they're living with the consequences directly from droughts to flooding to forest fires um do you think that the messaging has now changed and can you do you think that there's still recourse to be doing more to make sure that they're included within this conversation yeah um, i mean it yeah definitely i think we got it wrong at the start i mean we made a deliberate a decision to not sound like super lefty um, because I think you end up sounding like you're in a in a sort of bubble and you can all be in agreement using the right language and it, it bounces off everybody else so that people don't recognize that sort of language but I think in in trying to avoid doing that we didn't find our own language um, and and actually there, there's been brilliant work by Ian Hanny Lopez on how to message around uh, racist, the use of racist and other divisions. Um, so focusing on how it's used to divide and conquer people. Um, so I think that's been really useful research. I, I especially regret that it wasn't in our declaration of rebellion. And, you know, frankly, in some ways, I think part of the rationale for that, I'm not sure it was super conscious, but we is that by focusing on what would happen, it was starting in the UK, we focused on the UK, what would happen to the people in the UK and our children, it felt like um, it, it, in a way there was something about the climate crisis that people going, oh well, including myself, frankly, you know, we're going to own that, there's something that's going to happen to somebody else somewhere else at some other time, it's not like I don't care, uh, and you've got so much to care about, you can get care worn. So it's like we were trying to bring it home to people. This is what's going to happen to you. And it wasn't the intention to erase the fact that people are already suffering and dying, you know, in other countries. And um, as I said, you know, right from the start, we were setting up the um, Internationalist Solidarity Network that, was, that is led by uh, Global South, it's got a network across the world. and part of the job there is to amplify uh, resistance across the world and build connections between us and other communities of resistance and to learn from other people, you know, to learn from our families across the world. Thanks, Gail. Um, we're going to be coming to questions in the audience in just a moment, guys. So if you have any questions you'd like to directly pose to our guest, um, just press the raise hand feature and in our last segment, I can unmute you. Um, so another question I wanted to ask was about how you've said that um, XR needs to be a broad church um, and it needs to account for a wide variety of political beliefs and leanings and so on. Um, but some commentators are concerned that this has made space for eco-fascists who intend to resist climate migration and even see humanity fundamentally as the problem. Are you worried that eco-fascism has infiltrated the ranks of XR? Um, I think eco-fascism is a, 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 a serious and significant risk in the world. Um, I wouldn't say I've seen eco-fascism myself within XR. I've seen some people who are more right-leaning who haven't got their head around justice issues yet. And it's our job in XR to raise consciousness. Um, and we have run over 
a hundred, you know, anti-oppression workshops and we plan to do more, you know. So, um, and I, I think I think if you talk about what's going to happen um, to, to uh, this country and what mass migration might look like, you know, it could can trigger in people um, fascist leanings. I think I think there is that risk. We have to think carefully about messaging. There's there's been some uh, really good work done on on this about how to speak. Um, uh, the Guerrilla Foundation just hosted a conference on it, for example. So you know, it's when people write about this, we we are you know definitely trying to learn about where the risks lie um, uh, if you if you get the messaging wrong. Thank you. Um, so, folks, if there are any, we've got a question here from Terry. So, I'm going to allow Terry to talk. Um, great profile pick there, Terry. Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, Gail. Great to Hi. be glad with you. Um, I, you, the the fascist dimension to all this has come into play on a couple of fronts. And just FYI, I live in Central Florida in the U.S., which if you know what's been happening in the U.S. is kind of like a bastion of fascism. <laughs> um, and I refer specifically to the events of January 6th when the fascist domestic terrorists uh, very nearly brought Congress, well, they did bring Congress to its knees, literally. Mm -hmm. um, so on one hand, I want to say anyone who wants to see that face of fascism, just watch the newsreels from that day. Mm. That, and it's not just the ones who marched on the Congress. They had support within the ranks of the Capitol Police. And they had support within the Congress itself. Now, I don't want to get on a soapbox here, but I just want to ask the question, because I'm really curious to know how, from outside the U.S., Gail, and you, I'm sorry, I don't see your name. I see Oxford Forum for Questioning. I'm ready. <laughs> I heard it at the beginning, but I forgot. What did that look like to you from across the pond? I'm really curious as to how both emotionally, you know, without thinking about it, how did you experience that event as you watched it unfold? Okay. And intellectually and analytically, how did you respond to it? Gail, okay, would you like to say this on first? Yeah, thanks for that question, Terry. And, um, you know, there are people in the team that I work in in Exiles Money Rebellion um, who, were, who were based in the States. Um, so there was felt to be, you know, a very direct connection to what was ha happening. Um, I mean, this is, the, this is the state of the world right now, is, the, is that direction towards fascism. And you, and you see it manifesting and it, it, it didn't, it didn't feel surprising to me, to be honest, um, given what had been going off for the previous four years, the, you know, the rise in misogyny, uh, the rise in uh, racism. So that if you're, you know, an anti-racism campaign, you're seen as not patriotic. If you, if you believe in promoting the use of guns, then that's a sort of patriotic act. I mean, it does look quite mental, to be honest, like, but also we're just some steps behind. I mean, I was, um, showing Freddie this book, um, oh, I'm just grabbing it, it's just, um, th th that's about this process, right, Democracy in Chains by Nancy McLean, uh, which is the stealth plan that happened, that's been happening for, for but there, there is, I, I mean, I personally think the elite split very clearly, You've got the um, elites that go to the World Economic Forum that are saying you need a fundamental change, that we've got an inequality crisis and um, we need a diversity of voices and that capitalism as we know it's finished and so on. You know, um, a, a, a move in, they're calling it the Great Reset. Um, and then you've got um, a, a, a group within the elite that don't believe in democracy. Um, it's it's a it's a move in the direction of oligarchy, of corporatocracy, of plutocracy, and it's been planned for for many years. And I think uh, I think it was our George Monbiot who said um, of, of uh, Trump that thank goodness you only got Trump actually because he's just not that smart at what he did. I mean he was in many ways, but you know it's, it's what it paves the way for that's that's really worrying. 
Yeah, I mean, if you want my personal opinion, Terry, um, you're going to fail to get it here. Um, but you can watch a few of our OFQE debates over the last year in which we've actually tackled on this problem, especially in Trumpism and American Conservative this term, um, and in the past on electoral interference in the US election. Um, I'm going to take on a new question now from Lucy. Uh, Lucy, you have the floor. Hi. Um, so my question is for Gail, um, mainly in terms of you talked a lot about the Global South, and I was wondering, obviously some countries in the Global South are still developing, um, and they have to follow kind of a traditionally linear um, economic system, which is really, I think, the only way that development can occur without huge investment from other countries, which I would argue is probably slightly unrealistic at the moment. Um, should these countries be allowed to do so at the risk of higher emissions? I mean, considering the fact that the global north has benefited from um, the resources of the global south in their own development, and the south is now suffering the impacts of our development, um, halting the global south's development, even if it was kind of at risk of higher emissions, could reduce their quality of life much more so than for us. So do you think that they should be allowed to kind of um, to um, develop and to continue to develop in a traditionally kind of linear way um, at the risk of higher emissions? Um, I think that uh, there, are, there are many different economic models actually and um, in fact there's sort of nine different schools in economics so there's this idea that there's a traditional and linear way of developing I don't really know where that comes from I mean if you look at how Taiwan uh, developed compared to other countries there's just a, 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 a wide variety out there what, what I would say is that we need to get rid of neo-colonialism and then these countries would have their own resources to develop in the, the ways that they see fit when you look at economic growth paths I think it's only for something like the first ten thousand dollars of, of, of annual average income that you get an improvement in well-being for people and then it decouples so this idea that economic growth is a, is a good measure is, is finished, it's over, right? It, it, you cannot have economic growth and, um, uh, and a sustainable, livable planet. I mean, that's basically proven now. So when I say about getting rid of neocolonialism, what I mean is that, and it's organized by the UK, by the way, we are the number one creators of neocolonialism in the world through the city of London and the spider satellite uh, secrecy jurisdictions, tax havens, um, according to the financial secrecy index of the tax justice network that supports the, the robbing of governments of the equivalent of a nurse's annual salary every uh, second. So um, the, the um, countries would have access to resources to develop healthcare systems and so on if they weren't saddled with uh, the debt and the social so-called structural adjustment programs that were forced on them by the IMF and so on. So I, yes, the, the, uh, countries need to, 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 to develop and um, what makes sense is for them to uh, develop in a way that's would, would leapfrog over the sort of uh, fossil fuel um, pathway and, and, and move on quickly and they should have access to their own resources and be supported to do that. Right, we'll come to a question now from Nathan. Brilliant, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, thanks, Gail. I'm joining from the Oxford Climate Society, which does a lot of work on, as the name suggests, uh, th this topic. And we've also worked a lot with um, Oxford X XR Group. Um, I just had um, sort of a question that links into, I'm sure, a lot of young people and university students will be watching this. Uh, two sort of parts to it. One, what advice would you give to young people who don't necessarily want to, and I know you've touched on it before with the ethnic minorities, who don't necessarily want to sacrifice uh, getting uh, arrested because um, it may you know, severely impact their job prospects? Um, and, and also in terms of jobs, what would you, you sort of recommend going into if, if you're not willing to go that far, um, but, but, you know, to, to tackle the climate crisis in your day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, work. Um, it, thank you for that question, Nathan. It, it feels, it's sort of, I, you know, I'm a mother of two boys, 15 and uh, nearly 13, and it hurts my heart thinking about the future of young people and talking about what jobs to do. Um, and, 
you know, whether to get arrested or not, whether to use um, your privilege in that way. It's a, you all have to make that personal choice, right? Um, you're not getting a livable planet. You're not getting a future. You're not getting, um, you're getting multiple ongoing health crises. I mean, I think it's an, like, for example, and I don't know why young people aren't more angry, actually. Uh, Do Dr. Richard Pankhurst, who was Emily and Pankhurst, you know, the suffragette's husband, uh, the dad of fabulous Sylvia Pankhurst and others said, I, I, I should grab the quote, actually, it's a fantastic quote, but something like, um, I don't, so I'll be misquoting, but something like, I don't know why you women are so nice and patient. Why don't you force us to give us a vote? Why don't you scratch our eyes out? <laughs> and I sort of feel like saying that to young people. You know, why, why are you letting us get, my generation get away with this? We're destroying your future. Um, I, I understand that it's like my kids are like that. I just want a normal life. I just want to have families and have a, a you know, a, a decent job and a crack at living. That's not what's laid out for you. I, 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 I you know, I'm sorry to say that, but that, that's, that's the reality. Um, and I, I think, um, I think this thing would be done if uh, the youth movement would really take to the streets, sit in the roads, break windows, and all the other processes that people have done in the past to see change. And uh, I'm not telling you what to do, but um, I personally think that's what's necessary. Sorry. Thanks for that question. We've got one more time for one more question before we can let Gail go. She's been very busy today. Um, so, so Farus, Fazarus, I butchered that. And um, would you like to talk? Hello? Can't hear anything, I'm afraid. So Fazarus. Ah, okay. Well, I'm gonna have to disable talking, I'm afraid. Oh, we've got one more question from Davide here. Let me uh, uh, talk. Hopefully his microphone's working. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Perfect, thank you, Gail. This has been an incredible, interesting talk and you are, you are incredibly inspiring. I was here on behalf of Scoop UK, which is this movement that tries to make the green movement accessible to all. And I wanna go back to Freddie's point about the criticism raised towards extinction rebellion sometimes of being too white, too middle class and out of touch with the average UK person. How can we make, because you, you've said that for example, ethnic minorities and working class people in the UK won't be as affected uh, by climate change as people in the global south. But in order to really expand XR and gain that public support, we wanna make it as inclusive as possible for both activists, non-activists and people of all ethnic minorities. How do we create that from your, your opinion? How do we create that in the UK? Yeah, thanks again for your question, David. And um, it's, a, it's a question that our communities team wrestle with ongoing. Um, we, we're wanting to be this um, broad umbrella, a canopy, a broad canopy, as Kofi says, uh, in which people feel that there's a place for them. I, I would say, I think you have to see the environmental movement as a, an ecology of movements and that people will, there will be different places that people feel more at home in. Um, for some people, we just aren't right on and left wing enough, so, you know. Um, for, for other people, we're too much that. So, you know, you, you can't please all the people and all that. Um, the, our, our XR International Solidarity Network, again, are opening a, an office in, in Catford, Gothis House, which is uh, as the purpose of reaching out into the di diaspora communities uh, in the UK. We have um, a co-liberation approach to thinking about um, how we deal with sort of power and privilege issues that show up in social movements. Uh, we've been working on that, it's a very visionary approach. We've got a, a steering group focused on justice, thinking about how do uh, we lift up the voices of people who are traditionally marginalized. That's why things like XR working class are being formed so people feel, uh, you know, that they're in a home. And you know, you know my dad was a coal miner and, 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 and about half of us that started this thing were working class people. Um, and you see, the, you see that stuff in, in the environmental movement. It's the place where we kind of bounce off each other with, with, with class differences. Um, and it, it's, the way I see it, and I, I know, I have never seen anything intentional. It's just this, this stuff that we have to deal with. 
And I think it's a crucial question um, in how we resist patriarchy, is how we work together and how we act as a collective. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's about coming together now and, and um, you know, Joe Cox wise, you know, remembering that there's more that unites us than divides us, um, setting aside ideological differences and finding each other as a family. Um, and I think that involves really simple things like music together and food together. And, uh, you know, it's not about the fancy things that you say, it's about connection. Well, what a lovely note to finish on. Thank you so much, Gail, for an hour of your time. Um, it's been a fantastic discussion, incredibly insightful and informative. Um, and I hope you guys in the audience have really appreciated it as well. Um, we'll be back next week for our last event on the term on debunking conspiracy theories. Um, I've been Freddie Felton. This is the OFQE and peace and out. Cheers.